Hey guys, today we're going to be taking a look at understanding the derivative and linear approximations. And what this is going to start getting into is we're going to be doing a little bit of graphing uh, with functions so that way we can uh, look at what's something called local linearity. We're just kind of zooming into a function uh, so much that any curve that it may have is going to start appearing linear. So we can start seeing how the uh, tangent line is supposed to look uh, at you know an individual point, uh, picking up on that you know idea of you know that that instantaneous rate of change. We're trying to get that small uh, change to take place. So here, uh, what we're looking at. Uh, there are times when we're interested in finding the effect of a small change, which that's leading into the whole, you know, we want to have a, an instantaneous rate of change if possible. For example, how is the revenue at your local theater affected by a small change in the ticket price for a movie? We can explore that, uh, explore an application of the tangent line to a function called linear approximation. So that linear approximation, that's kind of uh, one of the things that we're going to be focusing on here. So I want to make sure that we highlight that. That's kind of a key word that we need to make sure that we're aware of. Uh, you've already seen that a curve lies very close to its tangent line near the point of tangency. If you zoom in enough, uh, the function is going to appear to be linear. Again, no matter how curvy uh, the function may be to begin with. So here, uh, but, but, but where, where do we leave off at? When you've zoomed into a sufficiently small neighborhood, Okay, meaning we, we, we're not looking for a big uh, you know, rate of change between our x values. Uh, again, thinking about instantaneous rate of change, something very small. Uh, when we've sub it would appear to be difficult to distinguish between you know, the function and its line that's going to be tangent to it. This is referred to as local linearity. So what does that look like? Uh, if you move here to the next bit in your notes. Uh, what's graphed for you is the uh, sinusoidal parent function, uh, y is equal to sine of x. Now, what they're doing is they're zooming in to the origin, essentially, and, and they're showing you, I think they zoomed in four times. So anything more than that is really not going to change anything. But if you have your own calculator and you can zoom in uh, on your own, what you're going to see is that as you zoom in to that uh, region here, this is kind of where they're zooming in at. Uh, as they get closer and closer and closer, the curve itself kind of goes away, and what we're left with is something that appears linear. And that uh, is going to approximate exactly what the slope of the tangent line would appear to be you know, when we actually graph those things. So by looking at something close and close, uh, uh, over a small enough interval, it's going to appear linear, and that is going to kind of mimic or model what a tangent line is going to do at that point. So <clears throat> here, uh, you can still kind of look at the graph in your notes. Can you estimate the slope uh, of the portion of the sine curve that you inspected? Uh, sure, the slope appears to be 1. Uh, we're looking at the one on the right side of that, that picture. Uh, so the slope. It appears to be a, a positive value of 1. What can you say about the slope of the tangent line at x is equal to 0 on the function y is equal to the sine of x? Uh, so here, what that would allow us to kind of justify is that the slope of the tangent line at that point, x is equal to 0, is 1 on the function y is equal to sine of x. Uh, write the equation for the tangent line. That's pretty easy. It's just the linear parent function y is equal to x. So moving on uh, here to the next bit. Now we're going to be uh, taking a look at some 
uh, graphs. Now what you're going to see is you're going to see uh, uh, four graphs in your notes. And uh, what I want you guys to do is I want you to pause, oops, I want you to pause the video uh, at this point and, and what it's telling you to do, it says, well, wait for your instructions, I guess. Uh, we're, we're sketching tangent lines and each figure uses a straight edge to draw a tangent line uh, beyond the point of tangency in each direction. Uh, so kind of looking at the two figures that we have here, uh, get your tangent lines at point A, B, and C if you can and uh, pause the video, do the four graphs, draw the tangent lines, and when you're done, hit play again so you can look and see how mine looked. Okay guys, here are the first two uh, graphs that we have. So on A, uh, the parabola, the inverted parabola, the, the slope at point A uh, is about a five from the way that I'm counting it. Uh, the slope of point B, the tangent line is going to be horizontal to the vertex, uh, so that has a slope of zero. And the slope of line C, that's tangent to, or the slope of, uh, of the tangent line at point C, I'm getting about a negative two. Now on the uh, absolute value function, the slope of the tangent line is actually going to be the same thing as the slope of a linear piece, uh, which is what makes up the absolute value function. So the slope uh, for point A will be a positive 2, while the slope of point C will be a negative 2. Oops, and I have those backwards. This one's negative and this one's positive. So the slope at B doesn't exist. And I'm sure that there are probably a bunch of you uh, that went, you know, drew your line like that, very much like what you, we would have done on the parabola. Unfortunately, the, the uh, tangent line doesn't exist at point B. Uh, and let's kind of think about it uh, as we come down. You know, is, as I come down here on uh, the side on the left, if I kind of come down here and I extend past it, well the slope here is the negative 2. And if I keep going uh, the other direction here from C, coming down here, the slope is a positive 2. Well, the, the, the left and the right sides, the slopes don't match. So that's one reason why, it's probably the easiest reason why we can justify uh, the slope doesn't exist at point B or the, the slope of a tangent line doesn't exist at point B. Uh, here, the tangent lines generally are not going to exist uh, at a cusp or a corner, depending on how you think of it. Okay, so those are the slopes of the tangent lines that we have in A and B, and uh, if you have not done them already on C and D, go ahead and pause the video now and work them out. Okay, so here is the worked out uh, solutions for C and D as far as where the slopes of the tangent lines are going to be at. Uh, at A, I don't think I drew it in very well, but that one's going to have a slope of about negative one-half, and at point C, the tangent line will have a slope of about positive one-half. Where at point B, just like what we did on example B with the absolute value function, we have, uh, this is what would be called a cusp. Uh, this point right here, the way the uh, graph kind of comes together, where the two curvy bits come together at a, at a corner, we would usually refer to that as a cusp. Some people are just going to call it a, a corner. But again, think about it in terms of the uh, slopes. Uh, here as you come down side A on the left, the slopes are negative and they kind of get more negative to where they go through point B kind of at a vertical line. And from the other direction here at C, Again, if I kind of come down here, the slopes are positive, but then it curves to where it's kind of going vertically through point B to be tangent to it. And again, uh, you can't have different values of slopes at the same point for something to be tangent. So uh, the tangent line at point B doesn't exist. And it's kind of the same thing at point A on the cubic or the cube root function that we see on uh, example D. Uh, here, this is uh, point A would be known as a uh, point of inflection. Uh, it's the 
point where the function changes concavity. So you can see on the left side, the function is concave up, but on the right side of point A, it's concave down. And where we kind of follow the curve, you know, the graph is, or the slopes are increasing until they're kind of going vertically. But if I come from the right side, the slopes are kind of going down like so, again, until they're kind of vertical. And the vertical line that we see for the slopes, we've generally referred to that as an undefined slope. But we can also say that uh, the tangent line at that point doesn't exist uh, because of its undefined nature. So let's take a look at some generalities uh, for things that they're asking us to understand with you know, where tangent lines are going to be in relation to the function itself. Uh, the position of the tangent line relative to the function depends on the concavity of the function at the point of tangency. Uh, there's going to be times in the course where you have to explain, justify, or defend your knowledge using proper terminology uh, and precision. And I didn't mean to put that highlighter part there. Uh, use the graphs from example two to uh, complete the following statements. When the, cur when the curve is concave up, the tangent line uh, is going to be below the curve. Below the curve. And let's see why. Uh, so let's say we have you know, some function. Let's just say it's quadratic, where the function is going to be concave up. And I want to pick another color for that, where the function is going to be concave up. OK? Well, if I have a tangent line at some point, Let's say I have a point of tangency here. Well, that tangent line is going to go like so. It's going to be underneath uh, the curve itself. Uh, so that's what we're going to say. When, when the function is concave up, the tangent line is going to be below the curve. Uh, when the curve is concave down, here the tangent line is going to be above the curve. And you can look at it uh, the same way here if you just had some sketch of a function where, let's say, we had a, a parabola kind of going this way now. And our tangent line was here at this point. Oops. Here at this point then the tangent line is going to be like that. It's going to be above what the actual curve of the function is. And what it's telling you here at point C, uh, at a turning point, meaning that we have uh, like a relative min or a relative max, uh, the tangent line is either 0 or horizontal. And that's kind of what we're seeing you know, in uh, a function that looks like this, you know, we have, let's say, kind of something going like that. Well, the tangent line at the vertex, at its maximum or minimum, is going to be parallel to the x-axis. It's going to have a slope of 0. <coughs> so let's slide this down. That was all we had on that one, but here... Uh, D, E, and F are kind of talking about the same thing. Uh, so here, a point of inflection, which is often abbreviated as just POI, point of inflection. That's the point where the concavity changes. Uh, and it says the tangent, in this case, uh, what we saw in the example that we saw, or, or that we had, was that the tangent line was vertical, or we would say it didn't exist. Now, that's true for certain types of functions. So what we saw there was kind of a cube root function that uh, did one of these things, you know, where it's kind of having a point of inflection here. So that's kind of what the cube root function does, where the tangent line was vertical at the point of inflection. Well, we could do the same thing. But let's take a look at the, uh, well, well, let me move this over here so I have some space to actually write on my line. Let's look at this function here. Let's look at the cubic parent function, y is equal to 
uh, x cubed. If I look at that one, I'm going to have a function that kind of comes up like this, goes through the origin like that as its point of inflection, then goes up like that. And its, uh, its tangent line, like if we follow the curve, you see it's bending here until it goes that way, and if I follow it down this way, it's bending until it goes that way. So the horizontal line here is the tangent line. So it's vertical in some cases for the point of inflection, depending on which way uh, the kind of function is going, uh, the way it's going to be bending. Uh, or it could be horizontal or zero, depending on how the inflection point kind of causes the slopes to bend as they approach that inflection point. Uh, at a sharp corner or cusp, the tangent line, the slope of the tangent line didn't exist, or the tangent line itself didn't exist. And uh, for a linear function, the tangent is the same as the slope of the line. So visually, we're trying to make sure that you can see where the tangent lines are going to be in relation to the graph. But uh, based off of what we know about you know, functions and their behaviors, how they're supposed to look if they're graphed, we can kind of make determinations just on those physical characteristics on how the tangent lines are supposed to be. Now moving on to the uh, algebraic example that we have here in example four, it says consider the radical function y is equal to the square root of x. Uh, the slope, uh, the slope or general function or general derivative of this function uh, is given. Okay, so they're giving you the function, and they're giving you. and they're giving you its derivative. At least here they are. I don't believe they, they're not giving it to you derivative. There we go. Uh, they're not giving it, they're not giving you this in their notes. And we haven't shown you how to get to this yet from the function itself, but we will at some point. So what it's telling you to do in part A on your actual notes where it says find the slope of y is equal to square root of x at x is equal to nine. Uh, it's telling you to use a difference quotient. <clears throat> this is what it tells you to do in your notes, use a difference quotient. Now having the derivative there is not bad because we can use it to check our answer when we do our difference quotient. Uh, but what I'm going to be looking at here is I'm going to use the alternative form of the uh, limit definition of the derivative because they're giving me this point here to, to work with. Okay, so I'm going to say, uh, in this case, they gave it to me as y. I know here they're using f prime of x, but they gave it to me as y, so I'm going to write it as y prime. Uh, and I'm going to say that this is going to be f of x minus f of a divided by x, oops, x minus a. That's the general, or that's the alternate form of the limit definition of the derivative. Okay, so here uh, we have the square root of x uh, minus, and in this case, f of 9. If you plug the 9 into the function, that's going to give you a 3 over uh, x minus 9 in this case, x minus 9 for x minus a. All right, and we're kind of tight on space here, so it's going to come up here. So now we're going to uh, kind of look at the function. We, we, we can't use the limit definition here without simplifying the, uh, the function because we're approaching 9. So I can't just plug 9 in for x uh, into this case. Otherwise, I'm going to have a 0 in the denominator. So we have the uh, square root of the x minus 3 over the x minus 9. So I'm going to simplify this with the conjugate of the numerator, I'm going to multiply uh, square root of x plus 3 
to the top and the bottom. And in the top, I'm going to get, I forgot my equal sign here. <coughs> in the top, I'm going to get uh, x minus 9. And in the denominator, we're going to get the x minus 9 times square root of x plus 3. And you can see uh, pretty quickly the x minus 9 terms are going to simplify to be 1, leaving me, uh, and again, we'll kind of come up here. Uh, I'm going to have 1 over the square root of x plus 3. Now, in this case, 1 over the square root of x plus 3, now I can do my substitution with 9, and that will give me 1 over square root of 9 plus 3, which would simplify to be 1 sixth. And if you were to take the 9 that was given to us, if you were to take the 9 that was given to us, and you plug it into this. This is what we should have gotten if we did the limit definition of the derivative. We would have gotten that expression. The reason I'm using the alternate form is because we already know what value we're going to be uh, substituting in for the function. where They're giving us x is equal to 9. So the general derivative isn't going to be something I really want. I want to know the actual slope, and that's what the alternate form gives me. Uh, but you can see that if you plug the 9 into the derivative that was given to you, you still wind up with the slope of 1 sixth. So now what it's asking you to do, it says write an equation uh, for the uh, local linearization. What's the equation of the tangent line at this point where x is equal to 9? Uh, well, where x was equal to 9, so when x was 9, that's going to give us a y value of 3. So those are the coordinates when x is 9, y is 3. Those are the points that we're using for our point-slope form. So I'm going to say y is equal to the slope of the tangent line was 1 over 6 times x minus 9 in this case plus 3. And so that would be the uh, equation of the actual tangent line. Now we're going to be moving on to part C where it says uh, using your result from part B estimate your value for 9.1 and it says very clearly not to use a calculator so don't use a calculator here. Uh, so how do we actually do the work? So the equation that we got from B was the uh, equation y is equal to 1 sixth times x minus 9 plus uh, 3. That was the equation that we got. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to plug in the uh, value of 9, or the where x is 9.1. So this 9.1, that is x. So I'm going to substitute that into my equation. So I'm going to get y is equal to 1 over 6 times 9.1 minus 9 plus 3. So I'm going to get 1 sixth times 0.1 plus 3. Uh, so this as a fraction, uh, 1 sixth times 0.1 is going to give me 1 over 60 uh, plus 3. And so the common denominator is going to be 60, so 1 over 60 plus uh, 180 over 60 uh, gives me a final 181 over 60, which that number is just above 3. Okay? And we saw that... Uh, you know, at 9, we should be right around 3. So if I'm just over 9, 9.1, we should be just above 3, which is what the uh, arithmetic is kind of showing us. So now it says to uh, graph the function and its tangent line at x is equal to 9. Well, the function itself, that's just the square root parent function. So uh, 4, we're at 2, at 9... 
we're at three, at 16, we're at four. So this is, and I'm missing it here. You just have this kind of gentle curviness there going, and it, and it, it keeps going like so. But uh, we are going to have our tangent line at uh, when x was 9. So when x was 9, we had a slope of 1 over 6. So from here, I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or so something like that. Something like that. And I'm going to have, a, and, and again, because I'm freehanding this, it's going to look something like that. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but that's what we have. So here's the point that we're trying to be tangent to at 9 and 3. So now, moving on, uh, we're still kind of looking at the same function, but now uh, at part E, explain whether your answer to B is an over or an underestimate. Well, because of the tangent line, light above the curve, this is going to be an overestimate. Uh, so here, I can say something along the lines, uh, the function f of x is concave down, which we, <clears throat> that didn't come out very nice, concave down, which will also, uh, we, we tend to abbreviate as concave down, ccd like that. <clears throat> Since the function is concave down, uh, the tangent line is above the curve making it an over estimate. So now find the true value of the 9.1. So the square root, you just type that into your calculator at this point. They're telling you to use your calculator. And here, the square root of 9.1 positive uh, on my calculator works out to be 3.017 uh, approximately. And uh, what we estimated it to be at 9.1 was just above 3. We had the 180 over, or 181 over 60. So, yes, we definitely have something just above 3 uh, that's verifying that observation. Uh, so here, last part on this example, would your linear approximation formula uh, be accurate uh, to estimate the square root of 25? Why or why not? And in this case, absolutely not. Uh, the square root of 25 The square root of 25, or what they would give us as our points, would be at uh, 25 and 5, is too far away. from the point of tangency to be accurate. And I can't spell. Oop, turn my pin back on, please. Be accurate. Uh, or generally, we could say it's outside of the uh, local neighborhood. Now you could, if you wanted to repeat the process of what we just did, uh, you could uh, show that the equation that we would want to work with there would be y is equal to 1 over 10 times x minus 25 plus 5. If you wanted to try to get some kind of an approximation uh, when x was 25. Okay, so moving on here. Now we're going to be taking a look at uh, some graphs, uh, or, or a graph, and we're just trying to uh, get its uh, 
you know, slopes and whatnot from it. So again, at this point here, I want you to go ahead and pause the video. This is something that I feel that you should be able to do. Go ahead and try pausing the video, graph the uh, tangent lines at the points that are given to you, and then fill in the table. And then when you're done, hit play, and I'll have it filled in for you so you can check your work. All right, guys, so this is uh, what I was able to come up with for the points that they're indicating in the table uh, the at uh, negative three negative two negative one half one and a quarter and four uh, these are the tangent lines that I was able to get at those particular points uh, graphed uh, on the fourth degree polynomial that you see on your left and uh, those slopes of the tangent lines are what's filling in the first column of the table uh, the point of tangency I'm just taking those from you know, what it appears to be on the graph itself. The slopes of the tangent line to tell you whether the function uh, behavior at that point is either increasing, de decreasing, or constant. And then the equations of the lines are just written in point slope form. So hopefully you were able to get all of that information. If not, make sure you uh, copy this down before moving on. And if you're still, if you're not sure what I'm doing to fill this stuff in, please be sure to ask questions. So moving on to the next bit. Now what we're going to be doing is uh, really going to start getting us into what's known as uh, curve sketching. It's going to be a very significant thing that you need to make sure that you uh, pick up early and understand well because it's going to be something that really doesn't go away. So here we know that derivative, the derivative of a function at a point represents the slope of the tangent line. Yes, we've established that. Uh, here, estimate the value of g prime of x for each value in the table by drawing a tangent line through a given point of tangency. Then estimate the slope or the derivative at that point. Now here what it's telling you to do, and this looks... Uh, oh, and that's kind of what we what we just did. Uh, so I don't I don't need to read that stuff again. This is where we're moving on to. I forgot that that little that that list little bit was kind of on that same uh, stuff with the polynomial. Uh, now we're getting on to things about uh, what I was referring to, kind of as curve sketching. Uh, here, when you plot your motion of something as a velocity versus time function. These are referred to as slope functions or f prime graphs. Uh, you see them a lot in calculus and physics. And these graphs represent uh, essentially a rate of change of the original function. Uh, by analyzing these graphs, we're going to be able to, to uh, just see where changes are occurring, whether they're occurring quickly, slowly, uh, things like that. Uh, here what we have uh, in this example, uh, we have a function down here. Uh, the looks like a square root function that's been stretched a little bit. Uh, notice the curve at the first point uh, of x is equal to 1 half. So here what they're looking at, at x is equal to 1 half, uh, they're looking kind of here at that red line. Uh, so the slope of the curve here appears to be about 1, and it's not exact, but you know, that looks like it's about 1. Uh, when you repeat the process uh, at x is equal to 4, you see that the, the slope of that blue line has decreased quite a bit. So it's gone down from 1 uh, to about a slope of a one third. And so if the function kind of continued uh, going to, towards the right as x increased, you can see that the slopes of those tangent lines are going to uh, get slower. I'm not saying that this one's going to approach like a horizontal asymptote or anything, but can you analyze and sketch uh, the slope of the graph on the grid? So here what we're doing where we're, you know, they're giving us the function on the left and they're essentially asking us to get its derivative on the right and we do that by looking at how the slopes are changing. So let me try and pick a, a color that you can see well enough here compared to the red. So if you look here, as x is very close to zero, the, we have a very steep slope. And then it kind of gets a little bit less and a little bit less. So at that same point, we're going to have something relatively steep for our derivative. Now we can kind of take the points uh, that they were giving us. Uh, so at about 1 half, 
when x is one half on the primary function, we had a slope of one. So here at one half on my derivative function, I'm going to have an output of one. And at when x was four, we were at about a third, so somewhere about here. Okay, and you can kind of follow those points like so. And that's what that one is, but you're, that skill by itself isn't going to be something that we're going to be paying a ton of attention to. What you really need to focus on is what we're looking at here uh, on the next uh, pair of uh, graphs that we see. And I think, uh, no I didn't. Uh, so comparing the graph of f, which is the function on the left, that's kind of considered the primary function, to the uh, graphs on the right, there's, there's going to be some things that we need to make sure that we uh, identify here. So let's look at some points of commonality. Uh, here on the function, I have a relative maximum uh, at about a positive 4. So this relative max looks like it's about negative 1 and a 4. And I have a relative min here. And that looks like it's, it's a little bit more than 4. I'm going to go with 4 and a quarter. And about negative 3. Well, let's look at the corresponding x values on the derivative function. At about negative 1, and a little bit more than 4, about that 4 and a quarter, uh, you can see that the negative 1 and 0, and 4 and a quarter, and 0, that the relative, me the relative uh, extrema, the max and the min, uh, those correlate to where the solutions of the derivative lie. Uh, so that's one thing that we want to make sure that we kind of recognize. Um, let's see, let's look at where we have some uh, increasing and decreasing intervals. Okay, so for instance, the function graph on the left is increasing along the interval from negative infinity up to about that negative 4, and uh, it's also uh, increasing from about that uh, oh, negative 1, not negative 4, uh, at about 4 and a quarter to positive infinity. So what do those uh, increasing intervals kind of tell us about the derivative? Well, on the derivative, uh, along the same interval from negative infinity to negative 1, my function is above the x-axis. The derivative, that is. And on the interval from 4 and a quarter to a positive infinity, you can see that it is also above the x-axis. So whenever I have an increasing interval on my function, we can conclude that the, der the derivative should be above the x-axis. Well, what about the converse of that? What if we kind of look at the, in the decreasing intervals? So the primary function is decreasing along the interval from about negative 1 to about uh, 4 and a quarter. Well, on that same interval on the derivative, from when x is negative 1 to 4 and a quarter, that's where the function is below the x-axis. So we can make the connection that wherever the primary function is decreasing, the derivative needs to be below the x-axis. Now there's another point that we want to look at here, and this one is actually going to be a little easier uh, if I look at the derivative. The derivative has its vertex right about here at about one and a half and negative two. So the vertex has its, uh, at, at its x values at uh, positive one and a half. Well, if I go to positive one and a half here on the x-axis, that is going to correlate to the point of inflection on the primary function. So whenever I have a point of inflection on the primary function, that is going to correlate where the 
a relative max or a min is going to be uh, on the derivative of the function. And let's see, the only other thing that we kind of can point out that's coming to mind right now would be the slopes here and here where the slopes are zero, but that's also going to kind of correlate to where the uh, roots are on the derivative. And I think that's kind of all that's come to mind as far as connections we can make between the primary function and its derivative. Yeah, end of the day is here, so let's try to wrap this up. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we have a little bit more to go. And I think I kind of uh, filled in a lot of stuff that we need to uh, already. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, starting at the left of the function, uh, state the intervals of uh, x where the graph rises. And, and we already kind of uh, did this. So I'm going to go ahead and put it here quickly. Uh, what do you notice about the slope of the curve on these intervals? State the intervals where the graph rises. Well, uh, the function is where it says rises. It's really increasing. So the intervals where it's increasing are from negative infinity to a about a negative 1 and from about 4 and a quarter to positive infinity. You know, here and here. That's where the function is increasing. Uh, what do you notice about the slopes of these curves? Uh, well, the slope, the slopes of f of x are positive uh, along these intervals. So starting at the left, state the intervals of the graph where it's falling. Basically now it's looking to see where, where do I have decreasing uh, intervals, and that's kind of in between the increasing intervals here. So that I have decreasing intervals from negative one to about four and a quarter. And the slopes there uh, is basically the same thing, but they're negative. So here, part C, uh, at what values of x on the graph uh, does the function appear to have a maximum or a minimum? Uh, what is the slope of the curve at those points? And what characteristics of the derivative uh, occur at that point? Well, here we're going to say uh, the maximum value was here and the relative minimum value is here. Uh, at negative 1 and about 4. And the relative min was about 4 and a quarter and negative 3. So uh, that's where the maxes and mins are. And what that correlated to was uh, the maxes and mins. Uh, well, we established the maximum and minimum value of the slope of those curves. Uh, the slope at the extrema, local extrema, is zero. And uh, what characteristic of the derivative occurs at this point? So let me illustrate that one in a different color. Uh, we're answering this last one here in red, in orange. Uh, the max, max, and min show where the roots zero solutions, whatever you want to say.
shows you where the solutions of the derivative are going to be at. Uh, so I got to clear this off to go down to D. So D. Uh, now look carefully at this one. Uh, why does the graph of the derivative reach a minimum value uh, near about one and a half? Can you explain what is occurring at one and a half? And yes, I've already kind of talked about this a little bit. Uh, this is where, uh, at about one and a half, this is where the vertex of the uh, quadratic was for the derivative. And that correlated with the point of inflection on the primary function. Uh, so let's see, why does the graph reach a minimum value? Uh, the, let's see, the point of inflection is, oops, I can't spell, can't write very well, where the slope is undefined. This is where the function changes concavity. meaning it goes from being concave down to concave up in this uh, instance. Uh, so, and it does, it's not asking us to really get into the stuff on the, deriv on the derivative function, so uh, I think we can go ahead and stop there with that one. Uh, so let's move on. So here, uh, this is kind of at the bottom of your page. Describe how the slope changes from left to right along the curve. Notice the intervals where the slope is positive, negative, and zero. And what we're going to do is, this is really what we're getting into, our, our idea of curve sketching. And that's getting us into this example here. Uh, so what this is asking you to do, it says, can you kind of sketch the derivative based off of the characteristics that we've just kind of identified? Okay. So looking here, they kind of give us these little number lines uh, right here. And what it's asking us to do, it's asking us to kind of identify the intervals where the function is uh, increasing, decreasing, or has a slope of zero. Okay. Uh, so we are going, looking at the primary function, uh, here this is my function g of x. We are decreasing up until we get to uh, a, a negative 2. We're decreasing until we get up to about a negative 2 because that's where the function turns around and starts going uh, back up. Uh, so it's increasing from negative 2 to about, it uh, looks like just about a past a 3, somewhere about here. So uh, we'll say it's increasing to about 3 and a quarter because I'm just kind of estimating where that's where it's increasing at, and then it starts decreasing again to all the way through infinity, okay? Uh, so here it's decreasing, so the slope is negative. At negative 2, the slope was 0. Uh, while it's increasing, the slope is positive. At 3 and a quarter, that's where I had another relative uh, extrema maximum in this case, and so this is where I'm also going to have a slope of zero. And then we start decreasing again, meaning that we're going to have negative slopes again. So negative, positive, negative, just to be clear on what we're looking at. And here, what this means is that on the derivative, on the derivative, here and here, that 
that should be a root on the derivative function. So at about negative 2, I'm going to just put a dot there, and I just pass the 3, I'm going to put a dot there. So those are my roots. Where the uh, function is uh, here, concave up, Let me go back to my orange color here. So again, we're looking at the primary function, the original function. Uh, it is going to be concave up until it hits its point of inflection, which the point of inflection is not quite at a 1. I want to say the point of inflection is about right here. So we'll just kind of estimate at about... Uh, three-fourths, about 7.75. And again, it's just kind of an estimation. It's not exact. And that's where it becomes concave down. So that means that my derivative, my derivative of the function, wherever it's concave up, my function needs my derivative function needs to be increasing and where it's concave down my derivative function needs to be decreasing so let's take a look here what is the function going to be looking like well wherever the function is decreasing we should be below the x axis uh, based on what we saw so we're decreasing on the interval from negative infinity up to about negative 2. So we should be below the x-axis from negative infinity up to about negative 2. I'm going to have be a, where I'm increasing, I'm, I'm increasing along the interval from negative 2 to 3.25. So I'm going to be above the x-axis somewhere here. And at just about the 1, we're going to have a vertex somewhere. So we're going to just kind of follow this up. We're going to turn, and we're going to hit the other point. So here's about where the vertex of the, of the derivative is going to be, based on where the point of inflection on the primary function was. And then the primary function starts decreasing again from negative from about three and a quarter to negative or to positive infinity so that means we need to be below the x-axis on the uh, derivative now there's going to be a little hint here when you're working with polynomial functions uh, because the derivatives of the polynomial functions are always going to be one degree less than what you started with uh, so in the first example we had a third degree polynomial we wound up with a quadratic here I have a third degree polynomial and I wind up with a quadratic where the, you know, you can kind of see that the leading coefficient of the, of the primary function, the third degree, is going to be negative based on its behavior. So the derivative is also going to be negative, meaning it'll be concave down in this case. So uh, here what it's kind of telling you, it's just kind of walking you through the stuff that I just did. So you can, you know, read this and go back over it as you, as you need to. Uh, so here, uh, at these x values, the slope of the curve is going to be 0, 0. Uh, on the function, we refer to these values as extrema or as a maximum or a minimum. And that's about all I have here. Uh, use your summaries to create the graph of the derivative. Well, we, we just did that. And that's about all we need to do on here. So the next bit that we're going to be looking at as far as trying to identify where a derivative is going to be is how you do it from a table. And this will be the last thing, and this won't take super long. Uh, here, based on what we see, we might have just some data points. Uh, the graph itself may not be nearly as accurate, or the table may not be nearly as accurate as what we could see from a graph. So these are very much going to be estimates. And whenever I have uh, a point, like say for instance, I wanted to know what is the derivative at negative 1 going to be? Well, I don't really have any you know, 
points to, to pick from. We can't really look and see what something is going to be tangent at, at negative one because I have no idea what the graph is. I don't know what it's going to look like because we have very discrete data points here. So what I would do is I would just take the points on the left and the right side uh, and that would give us what we would need for our difference quotient. So the slope of the tangent line would still just be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, but we just have to kind of take them from the closest points that we have to the point where we're trying to be uh, tangent 2. So what I want you guys to do now, because I know this is going on for a while, I want you to stop the video and go ahead and you know see what you can get here for estimating the derivative. And when you have this table filled in, go ahead and hit play again and see how your work compares to mine. Okay, so hopefully you were able to fill in the table okay. Now, while I was working it out, uh, I did notice that uh, at negative 2 on the uh, right side of the graph where the point is 3, negative 2, in your notes, uh, it looks like it's a positive 2. So uh, change that for me. Make sure that you're doing it with a positive 2 because I'm pretty sure that should be what's in your notes. So here we're just doing the difference quotients uh, with the points to the left and right of the uh, x value that we're looking at. Uh, if the x value is positive, we're increasing. Or I'm sorry, if the slope is positive, we're increasing. If the slope is negative at that point, we're decreasing. And like we saw at x is 0, we have a constant slope because the rate of change was 0. Uh, so please uh, make sure that you have your table filled in. And if you have any questions about it, let me know. And finally, last but not least, uh, we just have these fill in the blanks here to, to uh, put in. So when the derivative uh, is less than zero, meaning that the slope uh, is less than zero at that point, uh, then that means we have a decreasing function, or the function is decreasing at that point. When the derivative is greater than zero, we're increasing. And a relative max uh, occurs if the derivative uh, changes from, or if the derivative is equal to zero and the uh, derivative changes from positive to negative. And I think there's one more down here at the bottom, uh, which we'll slide that down just a bit. Probably could have made that a little short, a little bit smaller text. But uh, again, if the derivative is equal to zero and the derivative changes from negative to positive. And that is going to kind of wrap up uh, what we're looking at as far as local linearity, uh, how we look at the slopes of the tangent lines to determine whether something is going to be an overestimate, uh, uh, an underestimate. Uh, how we can refer to the slope of the tangent line to give us uh, the equation of the tangent line to give us kind of an estimate uh, at a point and uh, particularly pay attention to the stuff that we were looking at where it says investigating slope graphs or f prime graphs because that's where we're getting into things like uh, sketching in, into what's known as curve sketching where you either graph uh, a sketch of the of the derivative given a primary function or vice versa. If I give you the derivative, you should be able to come up with the primary function. So uh, that's going to wrap it up for this, guys. I apologize about the length, but it was a hefty uh, lesson to get through. Uh, but until next time, guys, thanks for watching and take care.